All right, if everyone's ready, then we can get started. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. Thank you all for coming to our professional learning series. Um, this is the tech edition. My name is Harleen. I'm an intern at the Career Development Center. I'll just be introducing you back and hanging back. However, I'll be introducing Anne, another lovely intern at the Career Development Center, and she'll be taking away and moderating this panel and having Anne kind of fostering this discussion with Daniel. So Anne, please take it away. Okay, thank you for the introduction, Harleen. And I wanna thank Daniel for joining us today for our professional lunch series tech event. And thank you to everybody else who joined. So for this professional lunch series, we really want our students to be able to get an intimate discussion and hear what Daniel has to say about his own career trajectory and his personal experiences. Um, but before we get started, I think we can also do some self introduction so everybody knows who's here and you can just say your name, your campus and what you're majoring in. Um, I can start. My name is Samantha. I'm a sophomore at Hunter College studying statistics. Nice to meet everyone. Nice to meet you, Sam. Hi, I'm Max. I'm a junior at Hunter College studying computer science and film. Welcome. Hello everyone, my name is Daniel Varghese. I'm a student at Queens College and my major is computer science. Okay, great. Does anybody else want to introduce themselves? If not, we can also just get started. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll take the awkward silence as a no. Um, so Daniel, he's here with us today and he's from GiveWith. So Daniel, could you please just introduce yourself and give us a brief overview of your career trajectory so far? Of course, of course, well, I'd like to say thank you for having me here today. It's, it's definitely a pleasure to be here. Um, to begin, my name is Daniel, as you know, I'm a full stack software engineer at GiveWith. And I, my career started as an uh, intern. I was an intern at CBS Corporation, where I was basically doing IT work, basic troubleshooting, what have you. And when the, once the internship ended, um, I, was brought on, I was brought on as a per diem employee, mostly because I couldn't work full time at the time. But during my senior year, when I could work more hours, I was hired as a full time employee. But once I graduated, then I started looking for um, roles in software engineering. And with the help of many, including Macaulay, um, I received a couple of offers, but I ended up choosing GiveWay, mostly because their goals align with my goals as well. And now I've been working at GiveWay as a software engineer for close to two years now. Okay, that's great. And I know that you're also a Macaulay alum. So could you share a little bit about your undergraduate experience at Macaulay? Um, like which activities were you involved in and what you learned from your time at Macaulay? Mm, thank you. Uh, for me, the experience was phenomenal. Well, mostly, especially because of the community that you're a part of once you're in Macaulay. Because I came from a very small high school, so uh, I was the only engineering student from my high school. So I was the only person in my high school at City College that knew engineering. But being a part of Macaulay, um, you get to do seminars with a couple of Macaulay students. Even before you come into college, you have the Macaulay orientation. So I felt like even before I got into college, I had friends, I had a community that I was part of. And some of the friends that I met at Macaulay uh, are basically the people that I worked through college with and I keep in touch with them up until today. So the first thing that I really appreciate about Macaulay is the sense of community that you get once you come in. And of course, the Macaulay advisors, they always excellent resources, the motivation, the help that they give you, that help me go in. Um, activities wise, um, Mostly between work and my classes, uh, my time was very limited, so I didn't get a chance to do much. But I know I did attend some networking events organized by Macaulay, and I especially remember one professional development workshop that I attended on Macaulay campus, which was definitely very helpful in teaching me some of the skills that I needed to succeed in a professional environment. So all in all, the experience was very positive. I, am, I never regret uh, choosing Macaulay over all the, uh, the other college offers that I received. 
Yeah, that's really great. And I'm sure a lot of us can also relate to the community feeling, although it's been different since COVID, since everything's on Zoom, but I think that community feeling is still very much uh, alive and going. So could you also share specifically some experiences that you had with Macaulay's Office of Career Development? I know you mentioned that one event you attended that really helped you. Were there any other resources from the career development that office that you partook in? Uh, absolutely. I think uh, the Macaulay Office has been a gem to me. Gianna and Jamie, um, I thank them so much. I owe them so much. Of course, the trainings and the workshops were very helpful. But frankly, I obtained my internship at CBS through an email I got from Gianna recommending some a little IT training program run by Empower. So when I did that program, that led me to the internship at CBS. And actually, Jamie was the one that helped me to improve my resume and work on my interviewing skills when I was looking for careers in software development. And with her help, I got um, offers from several companies, including Amazon. So I am really, really grateful for the development office. And I really, really recommend that you use it to your advantage at any opportunity that you could possibly get. Yeah, that's wonderful because I, I know we send out many targeted emails and they all have really good opportunities for all of our students. We're, you in any clubs or associations um, or organizations like that you could talk about for our students and like uh, through Macaulay or through your home campus during your undergrad that you could share that you think had an impact on your career? Hmm. I think um, I was part of a couple of clubs, especially at City College. I can think of IEEE, but the one that I think really had a big impact on my career is the ACM. I'm not sure what the, I think it's Association of Computer Machinery, something like that. Um, that may be wrong, don't quote me on that. But they have cohorts in several campuses. And what they do is they usually organize hackathons or workshops. And I think it really helps you learn the practical skills that you need as a, you need in the real world. Because for most of our classes that you take in computer science, you learn the theoretical aspect of tech. You basically learn the theory behind how code works, how computers work, all that stuff. But when you're with ACM, sort of learn the practical things that are happening out in the world, the sort of tools that people are using to build software. And you also usually get to work in a team with them, but usually they have these teams where you're hacking or building a game or doing some coding challenge. And being a part of that team at such an early stage, I think is really beneficial because software development in the real world is all teamwork. So the earlier you can get exposed to teamwork, the better you the better off you will be so acm if it's a cohort at your campus i really recommend that you join it be as involved as possible and it will really really help you develop the skills that you need to survive once you graduate college that's great and can you walk us through what a typical day looks like for you now as a full stack software engineer at GiveWith? of course uh my day usually starts at 9 45 uh, where we have a daily stand-up as a team, which is what we call as a tech team. And there each individual will discuss what they did the day before, what they will do today, and if there are any blockers. So work really starts after that, which is around 10 o'clock and ends at six. So even before that, uh, typically at the beginning of each sprint, which is what we call the block of time where we work to complete a specific task, usually lasts about two weeks. So at each sprint, we are all assigned tickets. Each developer is assigned tickets that describes a set of features that we want to add to the software that we work on or a set of bugs that we need to solve. So right after stand-up at 9.45, around 10, you will pick a ticket or I'll pick a ticket to work on and you will do as much as you can from 10 until the day is over. But of course, during the day, you may have a meeting or two, uh, either meeting with the product team or the design team uh, to walk through new features that they would like to add and get your feedback on it and help them create tickets for the next sprint. And also throughout the day, I would uh, perform what we call code reviews because in software development, once a, a developer wants to add um, code to the do that at some point. And that's what a typical work like for me as uh, any engineer. 
And what would you say is like the most fulfilling and exciting part of your work? Because I mentioned you do a lot of different things. There's teamwork, but then there's also like individual work. So what's, what's the most fulfilling and what, what is your favorite part? Mm, that's, a, that's a very good question. Um, I think it, it all comes to with programming, I think you all the tools that you need any idea that you have in your mind to like. So in my work, I usually have a production team uh, what sort of features the users will like and how it should look. So usually they just put together a bunch of designs. They may use some certain apps to sort of put together some designs. And usually they don't know if it's going to work out, if how it's going to look. Of course, it's designed, but how you're going to interact with it and all that stuff. So just looking at a design and taking that and making it come alive into a piece of software that people can use, people can see, people can feel it. I think that really, really makes me happy. And frankly, uh, one of the web apps that I built, um, it is being used by nonprofits around the world uh, to submit their programs onto our platform. And just to see users use this app that I built, I think is so fulfilling. It makes me so happy that I actually created something that is beneficial and useful to the world. That's wonderful because it's like seeing something that you worked so hard on finally being used and it's being used on a grand scheme. So it's it must be really nice to see that. And I wanted to ask you, so you had mentioned that you worked part-time as an IT support technician at CBS Corporation before you ended up working at GiveWith. So when you started your career in software development, what were you originally interested in and how did your experience at CBS Corp make you realize that you were more interested, um, that you shifted from support technician into software development? Thank you. Well, uh, frankly, I had always been fascinated with computers um, from a young age. I had never really thought about programming. You know, I would fix the neighbor's computers, that kind of stuff. So initially, when I came into college, I enrolled as an electrical engineer. And I started work in one of the IT labs at a city college. But after I took one programming course in college, I knew I wanted to do software engineering. But at that time, based on where I'm at, I had gotten into IT already, and I've gotten the internship at CBS. So it kind of felt natural for me to just stick with uh, where I am rather than try to find something else with the goal of finding a way to transform that IT work to something software engineering. So I talked to my manager, we came up with a plan, and I started incorporating some of my programming skills into IT automation. And I think that is what really convinced me that I wanted to do this. Because before I you know, started writing programs for the IT department, most of the things that they did was very, very manual. So sometimes they may have two documents that they need to compare. It would take like a whole day to manually cross-check things and merge things together. But I could write a piece of software that will reduce that to just seconds. So seconds, click on a button, you get the exact same thing that you would if a person was to spend a whole day going through a bunch of spreadsheets. So that kind of convinced me that, you know, I, I, I think this is my philosophy with software engineering in general. As humans, we are very smart. We can do amazing things, but we are slow. Computers are dumb. Most people say computers are smart, but I think computers are dumb. They can just do whatever you tell them really, really fast. So as humans, if we're able to teach computers how smart and take advantage of their speed, that is really the essence of software development. You have your ideas, you have your smartness, give it to the computer, it can just do it. What you would do in a matter of days, it would do it in a matter of seconds. And that's really what makes me love software engineering and what, make, what made me make the switch from just IT support to actually using my skills to uh, create innovative software. That's really amazing. I never processed how, you know, computers really only do what you tell them, but they can do it so much faster if you know how to utilize it and make it more efficient. So can you tell us about an achievement aside from, I know you mentioned the app that you had helped launch that you were very proud of in your career or maybe a few achievements, if you don't mind. Yeah. Um... And of course, I have worked on a few things that are being used, like I said, um, like I mentioned, a web app that is being used by nonprofits, I think over 100 nonprofits around the world. 
Um, and in a couple, I also helped build a sales platform that is being used by our sales team to um, onboard brands onto our platform. But I think the one achievement that I am really most proud of, I would say, is the, um, the personal growth that I've seen in myself. Um, less than two years ago, well, well, I guess a little over two years ago, I knew almost nothing coming into the software engineering world. Of course, I learned how to code, all that stuff, but I had imposter syndrome. I mean, I knew how to code, but it's one thing to know how to code. It's another thing to really design software, to follow the best practices and put together something that's concrete, scalable, applicable everywhere. So going from a mere beginner who learned how to code in college to this point where I am building software for others to use. I have junior engineers on my team coming to me for help. I think that really makes me proud of how far I've come uh, uh, over the couple of the, the years that I've been in software engineering. Thank you. That was that's very inspiring. And what would you say is one skill or attribute or even strategy that has helped you the most throughout your career? Because I know you mentioned there was teamwork, but then you also have had a lot of personal growth. What are some of these attributes? Mm. Uh, I think the, uh, the biggest, I guess, strategy or attribute or skill that anybody needs to survive in the tech world, uh, really, I would say is just the curiosity to learn and teach yourself. Um, which, I mean, I know it's two things, but it kind of go hand in hand. Because if you think about it, in college, uh, most college students, they limit themselves to what the professor is teaching them. So you may have a class in algorithms. Mostly you learn just the algorithm that the teacher teaches you. You don't you never go beyond that. But when it comes to the tech world, there are so many tools out there. It changes so fast. The tech that is being used today, two years from now, it will be replaced by something totally new. So being curious, wanting to know how things work, being able to teach yourself, being diligent enough to learn and teach yourself how things work uh, is a really necessary skill that will help you to always grow. So you never plateau, your skills never get stale, you always stay relevant, which is definitely, definitely needed if you're gonna be in the software engineering role. But I think being curious, being able to learn and teach yourself things on your own, uh, that is a skill that if you learn to develop now, you're gonna be using it for the rest of your career if you're gonna if you want, a, if you want a, um, a successful career in tech. Yeah, I think most of us see like every year there's always new technology, there's new gadgets, and it's so crazy that within like a, a year's time span, something completely new and drastic can come out. So would you say that there are any mentors or anybody who has played a, an important role in your career thus far leading up to what you're currently doing now? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. I think um, I can think of one of my managers at uh, CBS. Uh, his name was Stephen Sutton. Uh, I think he has been a phenomenal tool in my development. Uh, he really enhanced my strengths. So, you know, um, once you have an internship or job, your manager, um, they want to enable you. They want to make you look good because if you look good, they look good. So I was able to take advantage of that. And he really provided me with the work that I need to grow. Because, you know, as I mentioned before, um, learning is a big part of software development. Learning is a big part of tech. You have to learn new things. But it's even better if you can learn those things on the job. So what my manager helped me to do is he will usually throw things at me, give me uh, challenges. And that really, really helped me to continue learning, continue growing. and be able to go from where I was when I was at CBS to the point where I had written a lot of software for the team and be able to use those software that I had written um, as projects for my interviews once I was interviewing for software development. So I think he's been um, instrumental in where I am now and I, I am all, I'm always gonna be grateful for him. You had someone who was there to push you to do better in your field and kind of adding on to that, do you personally have any advice you would give any current Macaulay students who are interested in pursuing a career in the tech field? Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say, like I said before, uh, continue to be curious and uh, remember uh, why you love what you do in the first place, why you love tech so much. 
I mean, the more you can fuel your passion for tech, the better it be. It hardly will feel like work. And your growth just skyrockets because you're doing something that you love. And loving having that passion, it shows whether you're interviewing, whether you're part of a team working on something, it really shows. So being passionate about what you do, being curious, continue, continue to learn, I feel like that is something that um, as soon as possible, if you can start implementing all those things, um, it will just be even more so helpful once you graduate college and are ready to embrace the real world. Great. So uh, just like how you were mentioning about learning and how being part of the tech field and the software programming and engineering, you really have to keep learning to keep yourself up to date with everything. So have you faced any challenges or significant setbacks during this process of learning on your own? And how did you overcome it? And what did you learn from it? Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, I think for me, um, I guess the biggest was the beginning of my search for a career in software engineering. But prior to me looking for roles in software engineering, I didn't really know what, what it was like to be in a software engineering interview. Because, you know, I, the whole time I was working at CBS, so I wasn't like doing so many internships here and there. So I had really never done a tech interview before. So once I graduated, it, um, it just surprised me how hard some of these technical interviews can be. And I remember I had this uh, one interview with the, the company that I really wanted to work for. I think I'm flattered and help. And I, I did so well at the beginning and just the final interview that I needed to get an offer. I completely bombed that interview. And I remember being so dejected, so disappointed. And I think, I think what that taught me was that um, rejection can mean two things, especially if you're interviewing for social engineering. You know, of course, it can suck you dry, cause you to lose your motivation, or you can use it as fuel to motivate you to do even better, not letting that one event define you. And throughout your career, you'll probably hear more no's than yes. So learning to push through the no's and push yourself to where you want to be I think that really uh, taught me that. So after you know messing up that interview, I didn't let that stop me. I continue moving forward. I continue improving my skills. I just promised myself that okay, I messed up here. I'm never gonna let this happen again. And I did so many um, coding challenges on Lead Code. I remember, and I was able to pass the interview that I after that. But that was really a hard time for me when I messed up that interview. And I'm glad I was able to learn something from it and rise up from the ashes, as it were, and uh, keep moving forward. Would you say that that interview had, like what you learned from it was more so of like soft skills or hard skills? Like was it a technical thing where like they told you to code or solve something that you kind of struggled with? Or was it something like just something that you said or the way you reacted during their interview? Yeah, I think, I think it, it was a technical question. Um, mm -hmm. like during that day, at that, at that point in my, um, career, I was a little intimidated of tech interviews to, interviews to begin with. So once I got a question that I thought was too hard for me, my brain just fogs up. And my thinking was sparse all over the place. And, and it was just because I wasn't prepared enough. Um, I had done a few, you know, legal questions, but I hadn't done enough where I was confident in my own skills. When I saw a question that I thought was, was going to be too much for me, it just got into my head and you know, it caused me to basically do worse than I probably would if I had a clear mind. But from there, once I kept practicing, build up my confidence a little bit more, even if I have a hard problem, I know that I've done something harder than this before. So I can probably do this. And just believing in yourself in that way, that can help you accomplish so much than looking down on yourself. Yeah, so. I think that's a very important mindset for everyone to carry is that just believe in yourself. And even from situations like this, there's a lot to learn from it. So moving on to our next question, what is something that you wished more people knew about software engineers or just the tech field in general? Uh, I guess I would say it is not as scary and difficult or as complicated as it may seem. But yes, in the beginning, it is a little difficult because you know, if you're taking a computer science class, you're solving this algorithm, um, probably in algorithms, it's difficult, you have to change your mindset, think like a computer, computational thinking as they call it. It's challenging, of course, doing your tech interviews, 
those are more challenging. But once you get past all of that, the actual work that you get to do, it is not scary. Um, every so since I started working at GiveWit, there hasn't been a ticket given to me that I have I have not been able to do. You know, because if you think about it, when you're in college, sometimes you get a question in your one of your science classes and you just cannot do it. You can't. But once you get past all of that and you have those those foundations and you're actually working on a web app or some sort of software, iOS, Android app, mostly everything that you're given, you're able to do it. And you have the help and support to do it. And you have many open source pro open source uh, software, many documentations online that is there to help you. So really the most difficult part of software engineering is getting through college, getting past the code interviews. Once you actually have a job, it's not as difficult at all. So don't let the code interviews intimidate you. Don't let the difficult classes intimidate you. Once you get past all of that, it's straightforward. It's, especially if you love what you're doing, it's not scary, it's not complicated, it's very straightforward. You're mostly just adding buttons to screens some of the time. So that's, that's what I would say. That's why I don't think most people know about a textbook, especially those that have been guided in there yet. And if you have that mindset, it'll help you push through the beginning difficult ch challenges. Yeah, I, I think many people will feel very uh, comforted hearing that, that once you get past school and you get past the interviews, that things get better from there, especially if they're so passionate like you in your field. So uh, I noticed that you volunteer your time to work as a tech assistant for Black Girls Code. And I was wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that, why you got into that volunteering field and just your experience overall with volunteering for the organization. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, uh, volunteering is, uh, I think it's something that, you know, it's, it's close to home for me. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I got into give with in the first place. Because, you know, we've all been given skills, we've all been given gifts that we have. And you can, of course, use it to help somebody make money. You can use it to help yourself make money. Or you can use it to do something better for the world. So that's really the one of the reasons why I align with give with. Because what they're doing are helping nonprofits get funding. It just makes the world a better place. And if I can use my skills to help out something in that manner, then I'm, of course, uh, going to do that. But when it comes to Black Girls Code uh, specifically, um, I think for one, when it comes to the tech world, I think when I got into the tech world, I saw the disparity, especially women of color in the tech world, is very minimal. At one point on my tech team, it was just a bunch of men. And if I'm able to do anything to help alleviate that disparity, I'm more than happy to do it. So that's one. But the second one that I think I really, really is the one that motivated me to do that is um, I only learned how to code when I was in college. I think my um, sophomore year in college, because initially I was an electrical engineer, then I took a coding class and that, that kind of changed the world for me. And I just wish someone had introduced me to code at an early age. I feel like if someone had done that for me, my, I'll probably be at a different place than I am today. And of course, I like where I am today, but it would have been even more better than, uh, even much better than uh, today. So being able to do that for someone, help somebody to learn how to code, give them the skills, uh, the knowledge that they need to change the world, as it were, I think it's just phenomenal and fulfilling for me. So. And we have fun uh, whenever we um, help uh, the girls uh, learn to build a website, to do some sort of AI thing. Um, it's just amazing. And being able to give back, um, I'm more than happy to do it. So it's just something fulfilling that I like, I love to do. And I recommend anybody who is into tech, you know, give back. Somebody helped you to get to where you are. So it's only rational for you to also try and help somebody to get to where you are too. Yeah, it, that's really amazing that um, you're so inspirational and willing to put your time to help these young girls to hopefully pave them a career into the tech world so that there's eventually a better balance between women and men in that field. So kind of talking along the lines of curtain community situations, um, COVID-19 has obviously put a lot of us at home and things have affected almost everything for everyone around the world. So I wanted to know specifically how COVID-19 
has affected your role as a full stack software engineer? Because I'm sure there's a lot of tech going on to try and see what can be done to help with safety precautions or just help to alleviate a lot of the situations people are put in. Mm -hmm. so I think, uh, uh, first of all, I would say that, of course, as you mentioned, it has affected everything. So it has affected the way that we work. So as I mentioned before, you know, software engineering, you usually work in a team. And it's, it's just um, much better when you're with them with each other because you're able to run ideas by each other you take team lunches, team uh, lunches together. Um, it's just, you do sprint planning, that's where you guys get together and talk about what features you guys want to add to the, to your, whatever application that you're building. So of course we've gone from doing that to us being at home and um, being isolated. But of course, you know, work still goes on. When it comes to what I, what I let's, at least give with specifically has been able to do to help out the, um, the community, um, once COVID-19 hit, um, we, we got a request to add a feature to our platform. Because, you know, I, I don't think I mentioned this before, this before but our platform is, is basically um, a platform for brands as they're doing transactions with each other to be able to pledge a portion of that transaction, transaction to support a nonprofit. So when COVID hit, we added a new feature in our app for brands to be able to directly uh, give funds to us. And we have nonprofits on our platform that are specifically working to help those in need, provide meals to um, people who are in need. So with that new feature that we added on our app, brands are able to pledge a certain amount that they like, and they don't have to worry about how the money is being used. We take all that money that they give us, we don't take any cut of it, and we donate it to a nonprofit whose goals um, aligns with uh, alleviating COVID-19. So. Of course, it has affected us in a way, but I like that we've been able to do something, or at least me personally, use my skills in some way to um, help those who have been um, affected by uh, this virus. That's really great. Um, and I have one final question, which is, you mentioned that you spend a lot of your time or when you have time in random tech pursuits. So could you share with us one of the random tech pursuits that you've spent time on as a hobby? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. One, one that um, I remember or that I did recently, I'm not sure if, has anybody heard of um, Deep Fakes? D-E-E-P-F-A-K-E-S. Yeah, I have. Yeah, so uh, those who haven't heard of it, um, I guess in a nutshell, it's just basically, you know, using machine learning uh, to perhaps take a bunch of images and convert it to a video. And most likely you'll you get, you take a bunch of images, superimpose that face onto somebody else's face. So I may be talking, but it will look like Obama talking or it will look like somebody else talking. So I thought it would be cool to sort of use that on Zoom one day. So I got into that for a little bit. Um, um, I don't, it's, it's, been a, it's been a little bit uh, since I last re revisited it, but I thought that, that was cool. And I think it comes down to your passion because if you love to code, it's not even work for you anymore. So even outside of work, you're curious. I wanted to know how deep fakes work and how I can use that on my own. So I spent some time on it, just exploring it and seeing how it can be applied. You know, so you just create some fun in the office when I'm with my teammates. Uh, I, I'm sure many of your teammates appreciated that because it's always nice to have a good laugh, especially when you kind of see the same old, same old when you're using Zoom or these virtual platforms. So that concludes uh, the moderated question and answering session, but now I want to go ahead and open it up to our students. So we have a few students with us today for them to be able to ask Daniel any questions they would like. So you guys can start, you can raise your hand, or you can even just unmute because we don't have that many people. So I'll hand the mic over to the students. Hello. Daniel, thank you again for sharing that wonderful presentation. Um, I think a question I had was, did you ever take part in any sort of coding boot camp or anything like that? Or were all the languages that you picked up uh, just while you were a college student and you learned it from all of your computer science classes? Uh, good question, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I did actually. There is this um, 
I guess it's sort of a boot camp. It's called Code Path. I'm not sure if you guys have heard of it. They usually have uh, cohorts in community colleges. Yes, I have heard of it. Yeah, yeah. So I think I had some time at that point, and I thought it would be cool to do that. But I am glad that I did it. You know, could they teach you iOS and Android? And of course, I didn't end up going into iOS and Android. But just being able to explore that world um, of Android and iOS and working on the team to build a software, I think all those skills are necessary. And especially, I think doing something like that during college, it kind of motivates you. Because when you're in college, you're mostly like writing little scripts here and there, little app here and there. But being able to take that knowledge and actually build something tangible, something that you can put on your GitHub, that you can even install on your iPhone and be able to interact with it, I think that really motivates you to keep going. So yes, I did uh, do code path. But uh, I guess I'm not sure if you're, you're just, just, are you just concerned about whether it's necessary to do that to be able to get a role in software engineering or? I suppose a mix of both. Like I was interested in what your experience was and I guess using you as a case study, like the implications of that for um, getting a potential job. Mm. I mean, I would say it's, it's good in the sense that it kind of gives you some of the skills that uh, you will need uh, once you're on the job. But uh, for the most part, uh, as a new grad, once you graduate college, they actually have roles. I'm not sure if you guys have looked at that before. Most companies like Amazon, Facebook, Google, they have roles specifically designed for new grads. And they don't really expect you to have, um, I guess, any experience building a real app. As long as you're able, you know your algorithms, you know your data structures, um, and all that stuff, they will consider you and will train you as to as exactly what uh, tools that they use. Because each company uses different tools. So you may be really proficient in C++ or Python, but you may work for a company that uses Go. And you just have to learn that all over again. But with the boot camp, I think it helps because it, you're able to learn, well, in my case, learn a new language. And being able to learn how to learn is a necessary skill in itself. And to learn how to work with others and just write software is a necessary skill. So is it necessary? Not exactly. Is it helpful? Absolutely. OK. So you took part in two boot camp. Um like semesters, I guess you could say, with CodePath, the iOS one and I forget what the other one you said was. Oh, I guess the Android one. Yeah, so the iOS one, I did it on campus with a group, but the Android one, they gave me access to their online platform. So I was just going on there and going through the tutorials and doing that myself. So I didn't really uh, do that with a team on campus. I just had a little extra time. So I just went through that online on my own. But iOS, I did it with the team on campus. Oh, OK. Thank you so much. You're no problem. Thanks for the question. My pleasure. Hi, I had a question. Um, this is Max speaking um, about kind of like uh, the transition process. I just wanted to ask you more, like when you went from like your first role at uh, CVS to your current one now. Like, uh, was it? Uh, did you feel like your first role uh, helped you? Helped set you up for your second one? And what was the process like? Like searching for like, you know, like a, a job, like a your first like real job, I guess, since the previous one was. I think you said it was like a came from an internship initially. Um, so what was that like? Yeah, so um, I personally think, um, well, at least for, for me, what that really helped me to develop were the professional skills to, um, I guess, survive in a professional environment. Because, you know, it's one thing to be in class, writing code, blah, blah, blah. Another thing to be able to you know, relate to your manager, be able to give feedback to your manager, give feedback to other employees. Um, just being able to go, join a team meeting and contribute to the team meeting. I think that, and now of course that is all part of professional development. So that what I really, really got out of that experience is just being able to behave as a professional in general. I think that's one thing that a lot of um, 
students who don't do a lot of internship may lack once they go into the real world. Yes, of course, they know what they need to do. They know how to write code. They know how to develop software. But when it comes to like the soft skills that you need to survive um, in a company, you know, some may be lacking. And then that's why it's necessary to do internships while you're in school, because that kind of gives you exposure to the professional world. So you get to learn some of the soft skills that you need as a, as a software engineer. So that really uh, helped me to do that. I think that was the first part of your question. Does that answer your question or did you have another part to your question? No, yeah, that was exactly it. It was just like the, like the application process, like when you were actually like looking for this uh, second job at GiveWith. And it seems like it helped you, your previous experience. So did you like talk about that, like on your resume or your interview with them? No, yeah, 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 absolutely. I think as I, as I was mentioning before, when I was at that sort of internship job, quote unquote, I um, got a chance to write some software, solve some problems there, which is what software engineering is all about, solving problems. So some of the work that I did there, I was able to talk about it on my interviews, um, how, was, how I was able to use my skills to basically solve some of the biggest problems that we have and reduce the headaches that the IT team had. So yes, um, it was really beneficial and it gave me a lot of things to put on my resume. And um, once a company can see that you're able to hold down a job for a while, I mean, that gives you more points. So I think that was definitely very helpful in the application process and eventually being able to move from there into the software engineering role. Thank you. Thank you. That was helpful. No problem. And I see a question in the chat from George. He said, did it take long after graduation to secure a job? Um, for me, I would say it took a little bit. I Maybe not too long, I guess, relatively speaking, because I started looking for a job, which was the mistake that I made. I started looking for a job um, in January. Um, I had offers by, by March. By March, I had offers. And by April, I had a full-time job. But really what slowed me down in that process was, of course, at that time I was working full-time. So I only had but so much time to be applying to jobs and working on interviewing and all that stuff. So that really slowed me down. And the mistake that I also made is I didn't apply to jobs early enough. Because usually, ideally, and of course, I think uh, the career development uh, team can probably share some insight on this, but usually most roles for new grads are open, I think maybe a semester before you graduate, if I'm, not, if I'm not wrong. So that is really when you have to start applying for jobs. So most people, they have a job lined up for them after they graduate college. But I personally didn't know that, because I guess nobody told me that. Uh, so kinda, that kind of delayed my process a little bit. But I feel like if you start applying to jobs early, you start practicing or prepping, doing the interview prep, using the services that the career development provides early enough. For the most part, most software engineers or most graduates, they usually will have a job lined up for them right after you graduate because you've been interviewing while you were still in your last year of college. So it did take maybe three months, but it was mostly because of a couple of mistakes that I made. Oh, I'm glad you know that now, George. <laughs> yeah, I wish somebody had told me that because um, like I was saying before, they have these roles that are specifically designed for new grads. So if you go on the Facebook website, they will say software engineer, new grad 2021 or Amazon software engineer, new grad 2022. And that means it's for 2021 graduates. And usually they post it, I think a semester or at least a couple months before you graduate, maybe two or three months before you graduate, they start posting those roles. So if you can start looking for that during your the last year of your the last semester of your senior year, that would be super helpful. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak to that a little bit. So uh, I won't say specifically just tech jobs, but in general, there are full time positions that I know we've posted recently for they're expecting for graduates who graduate after the spring semester. So definitely check out Career Path. Did you uh, list Macaulay on your like education section of your resume or did you just like put your home campus? 
Yes, I absolutely did with the help of Jamie. I feel like just having the word honors in your college name, if they don't know about Macaulay, just seeing honors kind of gives you the edge. So I think what um, Jamie helped me to do is, I think you put Macaulay Honors College uh, at the City College of New York. I'm not exactly sure um, how I put it because I, I don't have a resume in front of me, but if you talk to Jamie or anybody in the career development team, they will tell you exactly how you can word it so that you show both Macaulay and your city college and your own home college, home campus. Right, right. Because I was also thinking like they probably know my home campus better than Macaulay, but yeah. All right. Thank you. Yeah, exactly. By just having Macaulay or if they choose to look it up, they will see that it's a program for, you know, exceptional students. So that kind of gives you, you know, brownie points, so to speak. Hi, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, Hi, uh, I have another question. Um, how would you know like which specific field to get into? Like, would you just read up on each of the fields and see which one interests you the most? Mm, I think that is a great question. Um, so for me, um, and I think, George, you mean like which aspect of tech? Because I know there's like machine learning. Yeah, yeah. Data yeah. Databases, web app development. Um, iOS development, all that stuff. So I, I think for me, um, the only way you can know what you like is exposing yourself to those things. So like I said before, I did take a course or a bootcamp in iOS development and Android. I kind of knew that that really that wasn't for me because it was so niche and it's just iOS. Um, I did um, something with machine learning at some point just to dabble in that to see how that's like. And um, at some point, I took one class in web development, and I instantly just fell in love. Because in web development, you have an idea in your mind, you build it as a website, people can go to it instantly and see what you build. You don't have to give them something to install on their, on their phone or give them this thing to install on their computer. Hey, it's live, go to this one and you can see it. So that kind of you know, proved to me that I want to do web development. But I think for someone starting out, um, I know in most colleges during your senior year, they allow you to take some electives. So just um, taking advantage of those electives to explore a little bit to see what's out there, or if you're able to get an internship, um, and that way you get a little exposure to what's out there, or just on your own, you know, touching different things, you know, trying machine learning, trying artificial intelligence, try data visualization, try um, graphics, computer graphics. And dabbling in a little bit in all those things, you're able to find something that you like or you think works for you. And it doesn't have to be one thing. Some people may like two things or three things, and you just have to maybe pick one. But for the most part, once you're working, um, it's good to stick with one and become really good at it. And perhaps also be able to do other things, but find your niche, find something that you're good at, not that you want to be the best as, as it were, but if you want to start dabbling other things, of course, you absolutely can. But finding that one or two things that you're really good at, it helps you to be a little more focused, be able to dive deeper rather than just be on the surface. Because your knowledge can be two things. You can have knowledge, in-depth knowledge, or just breath, uh, breath-wise knowledge. And you don't want to be like a jack of all trades, master of none. You want to be a master of one trade and maybe also know a couple of other trades. That's always helpful. But as long as you know one thing that you're good at, I think that's sort of good enough. And just exploring is what's going to help you find um, what you like and where you want to be. These have all been really good questions, but I just wanted to bring our attention to the time. So we'll take one final question, if any student has it, and then we'll move on to the concluding of the event. Yes, I have a question. Um, I just wanted to know, Daniel, what were the programming languages that you ended up knowing once you finished your four years of college. So by the end of that, like which languages did you know? I, I know you probably learned some more stuff from then, but by the time you were done and ready to apply like C++, Java, et cetera, I was just curious what your list looked like to see if I was staying on track. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, in, in school, of course, I started with C++. That's what most of our classes is taught in. And in one class, my teacher started using C, and I thought C was kind of cool too, so I learned C as well. And I didn't get a chance to take a Python class, but there was, 
that I, I think, um, yeah, I think I chose to take a, a Python class. So I learned Python when I was in school as well. And then when I started, when I took my web development class, I learned JavaScript and then HTML and CSS. But frankly, since then, on, on a daily basis, I only use Python and JavaScript, HTML, C++. Sorry, HTML, CSS, not C++. So those are the only three that I use. And because I'm a full stack developer, I do backend and our backend APIs are in Python and the front end is written in JavaScript, HTML, CSS. So those are the sort of the um, coding languages that I use. But I also learned Java at one point, but I haven't really used it since then. So usually they recommend knowing at least two programming languages really well. I think on the industry-wise, that's sort of the standard. So knowing two programming languages really well so if you're because you're able to learn one programming language and learn another one then it's expected that if you need to learn a third one it's not going to be that difficult so knowing at least two really well i think that's good enough you don't need to know a thousand languages because frankly you're not going to use more than three on a daily basis usually most engineers i see two maybe three uh on a daily basis but usually no more than that Okay, thank you so much. No problem. All right, thank you so much, Daniel, for joining us today and taking time out of your schedule to really discuss about your experience with the Macaulay Career Development Center and your career trajectory to your position today. Really, I think we've all gained a lot of insight from your answers today, and we really, we really appreciate you coming. Um, that being said, I encourage everyone to, all the attendees, to um, fill out our poll, uh, just to get, provide us some feedback on how our event went, um, what we can do better, so on and so forth. And in the meantime, because Daniel mentioned the Career Development Center um, a few times and they did come up in conversation here and there, I would also love to talk about the offers and what we have to offer and how we can help you and your career path as well. So that being said, um, uh, yes, Jamie and Gia, who are not here today, unfortunately, are, are our um, Career Development Officers. And they're here to help you guys uh, really perform well in your career path and guide you into what you can, um, what you can do, and just provide you any advice. You are you are able to book an appointment with them for any guidance and advice, and they can walk you through your own resume and give you some uh, tips and tricks in your own career field that you want to pursue. And they can really tell you what career path timeline to follow and what to do and what next steps to follow. That being said, I'm going to put in the chat our career development website that is on Macaulay. I encourage you all to visit this website. There are many other resources that you can visit as well. We have guidebooks that talk about several industries. We have um, a guidebook that talks about different offer opportunities that come up in different industries. So if you're, again, this is tech, so if you're interested in tech, there's definitely resources out there in our guidebooks. Uh, there are more general guidebooks out there as well that talk about basic career guidelines and so on and so forth. And you can also see student perspectives in our student blogs. That being said, we enjoy, we really enjoyed this event. Thank you all for joining and thank you once again to Daniel for participating and really being able to be in our event and speaking at our event as well. Hey, the pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me. Thank you. All right, and that being said, if you fill out the poll, you can feel free to leave and have a wonderful weekend.